I'm in, a, I'm in a wonderful place. I love being here in front of you. But I'm in a difficult place because I'm between Pradeep, who had these deep insights, and Jim, who's going to talk about driving as the ultimate expression of human ingenuity and, and expertise. And I'm going to talk about self-driving. So Jim is going to look daggers at me, and Pradeep is going to say, what's he talking about? <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm, I, I want to talk about the networking grand challenge. Um, and for those of you who know about self-driving cars, um, you might understand uh, where this is coming from. But I'll, I'll, I'll set it up. And really, the, the call here is to say, can we as an industry rise to this? Um, so when is a vision worth pursuing? Um, and you know, this, this, this part of it is motherhood and apple pie. But it is important to remember this, because people just throw out new ideas and say, let's go do this, and we should just do it, without really thinking about why we should pursue it. And so while these are standard things, you know, we have to solve real problems, we have to you know, do something that makes business sense. Uh, and Pradeep loves saying we should not violate laws of physics, so it has to be technically feasible. Um, there is one part that people miss, opening up possibilities that you could not have thought of before. You could not visualize it, you could not think about it, because it just wasn't there. So, I would like to throw one of those things, hopefully, one of those things at you. Um, but if you, if you take that for granted, then the next question is, how do we get there? What, how do we um, make this, this transition? So I'm going to switch gears and talk about cars for a little bit. And hopefully, you've seen the car outside. Um, we started off 130 years ago with this thing called the Benz patent motor wagon. Um, it was a very, very mechanical thing, very, very manual. You had to do everything yourself. Um, if you're really interested, go to Wikipedia and look it up. But it was a big jump. But it was still, there's lots of things in there that you had to just do just right. Um, nevertheless, um, Mrs. Benz said, my husband is not really good in marketing, so I'm just going to steal the car and run off on this 194 kilometer journey to prove that this actually is something worth pursuing. So she did. And it's now called the Bertha Benz Memorial Route. Remember that. <coughs> so we started with this very, very manual um, car. And we said, OK, let's start taking bits of it and automating. And uh, you probably have seen from the schedule, we're really big into automation. Pradeep mentioned it a few times. Rami just loves it. Um, so here we are taking the car and automating bits of it. So instead of starting with a crank, we have an electronic starter. Instead of manual transmission, and I should say I really love changing gears uh, myself. I actually know how to operate a pedal, um, a clutch. But we have automatic transmission. We've got power steering. We've got cruise control, adaptive cruise control. We've got a bunch of things that makes driving cars easier. So these are all great innovations. They make driving easier, safer, convenient. People who could not otherwise drive can drive because we have all this. So are we done? You know, is this the end of innovation with cars? <sighs> not exactly. There was a grand challenge by DARPA back in 2004. They said, can you build a fully autonomous ground vehicle? And Pradeep and I didn't collude on our slides, but he did talk about fully autonomic um, uh, operation of networks. So that's, that's where we're going. So the goal was to drive this 240 kilometer course. So it's sort of like the Bertha Benz Memorial Route. But this was on um, I-15 in the Mojave Desert. And basically, they said, here's a million dollars. So if you, if you actually manage to do this in the least time, you get a million dollars. <clears throat> and what happened? In 2004, there were some 20-odd teams. None of them made it. In fact, they didn't even make 5% of the route. Um, they got about 11.3 kilometers, the best. But they tried again in 2005. And five out of the 23 teams did make it. And it's actually a pretty amazing thing. 
They hadn't thought of this before. Maybe some people had some ideas, but they hadn't really focused on this. And in a year and a half, they actually did this. And then, OK, that's you know, only robotic cars running on an empty freeway. Oh, it's not so hard, maybe. So let's do this in an urban environment. Let's do this with humans also driving. Let's follow traffic laws. Let's do this. It was an army base, so you know, take it with a pinch of salt. But six uh, cars made this challenge as well. The thing is, at the time, they didn't say, what is the impact of um, self-driving? What does it mean to society? What does it mean to cars, to you know, the whole industry? And they didn't look at what the possibilities were. At the time, there was no Uber. Um, most of you should know this, but Uber has already started a self-driving um, <coughs> effort in Pittsburgh, where if you call up Uber, you could be randomly assigned a self-driving car with a couple of people in it to make sure that it doesn't do something crazy. But it will drive itself. Uh, it will drive you to um, your destination. So the grand result of all this, uh, in 2009, Google had a decked up Lexus with lots of equipment on it um, to do self-driving. And in 2014, you had this, I call it a ladybird car. Um, I don't know, it, it's a funky looking car. It has no steering wheel, has no pedals, it's completely autonomous. This is not an incremental improvement, this is a disruptive change. Um, and you can see articles in the New Yorker and in Forbes about how this was done, why it should be done. But this is a huge, huge uh, change in how we look at driving. So I want to go from there to self-driving networks. And yes, everyone talks about SDN. So I love repurposing this acronym. So this is, this is my expansion for SDN now. <coughs> so if I phrase this in the same grand challenge, the networking grand challenge would be to, to build a self-driving network. So what does that mean? A network that self-discovers, these are my components, it self-configures, puts all these things together, it monitors itself, it corrects things that are, you know, needs to be corrected, it detects new customers coming on, automatically gives them the right service, uh, analyzes what should be done in terms of how to improve or optimize itself, and then reports once in a while so the humans can sort of figure out what's going on. So, that's the challenge, that's the goal. Uh, I don't have a prize. But I will keep a hat out there, and please, on your way out, put some money in. I'll give it back to you if you manage to do this. <laughs> um, and the, the result is to free up people. I mean, this is, this is how we progress. Um, we free up people from doing mundane work, from you know, doing things that are not fulfilling from doing things that are actually um, negative for some of them to doing higher level stuff. So service design, service creation. Um, and then the other side of it is to have a network that is, to use uh, Pradeep's word, agile. In fact, to go beyond that and to be anticipatory and say, this is what should happen. You didn't think of it, but I'm analyzing what's going on. I'm trending things, and I need to do this before you realize that it needs to be done. And especially important is fast, uh, intelligent response to security breaches. So there are many things in networks where the time constants can be pretty long. But when there's a security breach or a potential uh, security hole, you want to have a very quick response. So, so the challenge, there are many ways of phrasing this. But uh, one way of phrasing it is, um, run a data center you know, with no human operation, no human intervention. And I don't mean you know, sit far away and tell that in, because yeah, that's still a human operator. No human operation. And um, you should do this with no reduction in functionality, no compromise. The, the, network, the, the network inside the data center should work as well as with humans 
probably better, but as well as with humans sitting, typing at keyboards. So what's the impact? What are the possibilities? We'll look into that. But one of the things I want to say is, unlike with self-driving cars, I don't want to get there and say, here's the technology. Now let's look at the impact. Now let's look at the possibilities. I want to start thinking about that now. So I will repeat the challenge, because this is actually a crucial part. Can you run a data center? Or can you run an edge network? Or can you run any part of this network with no human intervention, with no compromise in functionality? And it, it's a difficult one, because um, if you look at the Google self-driving car, the Lexus, um, which was, you know, would drive on the freeway, would do all kinds of things, there's a human sitting waiting in case it needs to take over. And they did need to take over a lot. They don't mention that a lot. But if you read the articles, you'll see that. If you look at this bubble car, um, it is completely self-driving but maximum of 25 miles an hour. So in both those cases, they've reduced the requirements on self-driving. And I think that's not a bad idea. Um, so for networks, finding a domain where we can say, let's be self-driving here. Let's take this part of the network and make it completely autonom autonomous. Um, so it could be a data center. It could be an edge network. A core network is maybe a little too easy. But you know, find that domain and really define what it means to be self-driving, and let's do it. So here are five technologies that I think are important for self-driving. And I don't want to do this, I don't want to think about this from a technology point of view. The goal is self-driving. But I do want to point out that these are technologies that Juniper is working on. And I think the industry should be working on. And again, no collusion, but this overlaps quite well, not perfectly, so you can understand that there's no collusion, with what Pradeep talked about just now. There's telemetry, and this is the idea of getting information from the network in real time, in a machine consumable way, so we talk about data models. Automation, well, hopefully you've seen lots of sessions on automation um, just in these last two days. <clears throat> Declarative intent. Say what you want, not how to do it. Um, decision making. It could be rule based, it could be machine learned, or it could be both. And in fact, it'd probably be both. And then what you look at local views and global views. So let's go into this in some detail. Um, I'll point out in cars, you've got all kinds of telemetry. You've got tire pressure sensors, you've got engine speed, you've got wheel speed. You've got differential between the left and the right side. You've got all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> but one thing that I will point out is the LiDAR. It's a light-based radar. Google's car, the Lexus, was a $70,000 car. It had $150,000 of stuff in it, added to it. Of that $150,000, $80,000 was for the LiDAR. You can think of reasons why a car might have a radar, might have sonar, might have all these other stuff. Um, the sonar is for park assistance. The radar is for adaptive cruise control. But the LiDAR is to give you a full 3D picture of everything that's around you for a distance of 30 meters. You would not put that in a car, not just because of the cost, but why would you want that in a car until you say self-driving? And I want you to keep that in mind because when we start looking at network telemetry, I want you to think about what is it that we're missing that it would be really hard to drive, to self-drive a network if you don't have this bit of telemetry. And that's why I put this up. But in the network, of course, we do have a lot of telemetry today. We have SNMP information, we have traps, we have uh, NetFlow, JFlow, SFlow. You've got DPI and IDS when you need it, typically not all the time. But we need to go from that <coughs> to streaming telemetry. And in the future, we need to do more of this, not just to do more telemetry, but to do um, what I call zoom in, zoom out. So I look at something, I say, wow, there's something going on there. Let me know more about it. 
Let me look at what's happening at layer one, layer two, layer three, layer seven, and correlate that. Let me see what's happening in this part of the network and that part of the network and correlate that. Let me look at time sequences, time series, and say, what is the trending? How do I know what is the baseline for the network? Is the baseline being violated or is the baseline actually changing? So we need deep telemetry for all of this. And if you went to the session this morning, uh, Open Vision, which Nitin Kumar was leading, we're talking about what we're doing in telemetry. And Pradeep talked about Open Collector. So we're going to stream this telemetry at you in a way you can consume. The next is automation. And we've talked a lot about automation. Um, and it's important. And I don't think we do enough of it. But this is a stepping stone to a completely self-driving network. I will mention one example that I did earlier today, which is auto bandwidth. The idea that you tell the network from, from point A to point B, I need some bandwidth reservation. But in, instead of saying it needs to be one gig, you say, what if it's five gig? And <coughs> sorry, what if it's 500 meg? But as you see the traffic coming close to 500 meg, increase it to 700 meg, increase it, you know, and go up to a certain point. So this is something we've already done. This is called auto bandwidth. But we don't do smart auto bandwidth. And what I mean by that is, ask why the traffic is increasing. Is it someone downloading the latest album from Beyonce or whoever? Or is it someone doing a DDoS attack? If it's the former, yes, open the doors. Open the gates wider. If it's the latter, shut it down. So we need to get smarter. I mean, automation is great, but we, we, can't do, we can't let automation be a vehicle for people to breach our networks. Statement of intent, declarative statement of intent. If you go into this uh, bubble car from Google, the, there's just the one screen. Well, there's the one screen and a big red button. But the one screen says, tell me where you want to go. So you put in. You know, I want to go to this destination. And you can give some hints. I want to go fast. I want to go efficiently. Me, I have an electric car, so I want to go efficiently where the battery will actually last till I get there. I don't have a Tesla. I have a Leaf. So I need to plan these things carefully. Um, but you might ask, why even do that much? Why doesn't the car read my calendar and say, hey, I see you have an appointment here. I'll just take you there. Or why doesn't the car say, yesterday at 8 o'clock, you dropped your daughter at school, and then you went to work, and day before yesterday, you did the same thing. For the last you know, three months, you've been doing that. So I'll just do that. So again, the statement of intent is a starting point. But, and and I, I think this is what Rami talked about in his digital cohesion where you start bringing these things together and saying, I have a technology for this, but I can go beyond. Um, so we have a declarative statement of intent today. Um, so North Star, you say, I want a path from point A to point B. I want so much, um, so much bandwidth. I want this kind of diversity. Go make it happen. In uh, Contrail, you say, I want these VMs to be connected in this virtual network. I don't know where they are. Find them, put them in the same virtual network, and make it happen. So, so we do have declarative intent, but we need to get to the next level to be more and more divorced from the details of the topology, of the devices, of the operating systems. And so maybe you just want to say, I have these five peers. This is a good peer. This is an expensive peer. That's a low latency peer. Put the right applications over the right peers. And just give that high-level hint and say, go make it happen. <coughs> Decision making. Um, it could be rule-based, or it could be machine learning. And rule-based is, well, at least you feel you're under control. You say, do this, do that. If you see this, do this, et cetera, et cetera. And it can get cumbersome, but you think you know what's happening. Now, it can get complex enough that you really don't, but we like to think we're in control. But machine learning is creative. And I, I say that you know, in double quotes. So you don't always know what it's going to do. And you don't know how it's going to learn. So when Google, the Google team, decided to do decision making for the Google car, the self-driving car, they said, we need some rules. 
some absolute things like don't drive over pedestrians. It's probably a good rule. But the, <laughs> there was also the part that says, just drive, keep driving, and I'll tell you when you did well, I'll tell you when you did bad, and you learn how to drive. And the last is a local view and a global view. There's this thing about SDN that says everything should be centralized, the, the other SDN. Um, and that's, there's a part of that. I mean, Pradeep said, if you want to do optimization, it's good to have a global view, and that's the best way to do optimization. But not everything has to be centralized. So you want a local view, you want a global view. And you want to make decisions based on what you see near you, and you want to make some decisions based on what's happening far away. And you want to be able to coordinate all that. So again, if you go back to driving, you need to know what cars are in the lane next to you, what cars are in front of you and behind you, but you also need to know what's the traffic you know, in five miles. You want to know what the different freeways are doing so you can make a better choice of freeways. So there is that aspect, both in cars and networks, of knowing what's near you and knowing what's far away. So why would I want to do this? Today, when there's an event, for example, Super Bowl 60, I would say, OK, let me start planning for that, because you know, the network is now a very big part of any of these events, whether it's a sporting event or a music you know, concert or whatever. And in fact, you know, um, Rami Pradeep and I, Jonathan Pradeep and I, I don't even remember, um, went to see NTT at the beginning of the year, and they'd already started planning for the Olympics in 2020. So they, they started four years, five years ahead of time planning for that. But imagine that you could just dial up and say, I need all this equipment to arrive at the stadium the day before the event, in this case, the Super Bowl, and it'll order itself, it'll deliver itself with a self-driving truck, and um, when it gets there, the equipment will self-organize and say, whoa, here we are. We're going to have the Super Bowl, or we're going to have the Olympics, or whatever the event is. And uh, when the event is done, it'll disassemble and go away. I mean, today, the amount of planning that goes into just the network piece for any such big event is huge. Do we have to do it that way? There's also going to be a huge impact. And if you look at what GM is thinking about in terms of what they should do with cars, if you look at what Uber is thinking about, they have this million workers. Call them employees, call them contractors. That's a decision for the courts, for different people. But they're saying, instead of that, I want programmers. I want operational people. They'll tune the self-driving. They'll tune my AI. So in networks, if we do this, we will see a big change, or potentially we can see a big change, that um, essentially, instead of being, you guys all did your certification, right? So you're all JNCIEs. Uh, but instead of that, you might say, that knowledge is really useful. I'm going to now go help the AI to be as good as I am. Might not sound good, but. Um, but we do need that. We do need um, people that understand how the network works to train the AI so that they can do better, higher level jobs. So we have algorithmic tweaking. We have service design for, for new network services. But the most important thing is the network gets out of the way. So I don't know how many of you read James Hamilton's piece many years ago saying the network is in my way. He wants compute to do what it needs to do. He wants storage to, need to do what it needs to do. But the network is just getting in the way. And if we had a self-organizing, self-configuring, self-driving network, the network would do what it needs to do, and you wouldn't have to see it. You wouldn't have it getting in the way. The networks would adapt, react, anticipate, and do stuff that you need them to do before you even understand that. Security becomes a fight between the good guy bot, which is you know, the bots running in your network, and the bad guy bot, which is the bots trying to break in 
or subvert your network. And you would sit back and watch that fight and say, uh, you know, if I need to, I can help the good guy bot. But most of the time, human reactions are not fast enough for this. So you really want the bots on your side. And if all goes well, you could be sitting, sipping a Mai Tai, you know, on your hammock and watch stuff happen as opposed to sit there, you know, inside a hot central office typing away. So the point is, if you visualize a self-driving network, making it happen is one part of it. But then you need to think ahead and say, what is the impact of having a self-driving network? What is the impact of um, the skill changes that I need? What is the impact of um, all these um, services that my customers want? And the other side of it, what are the possibilities that I can't do today, I can't even visualize today, that I could if I had this? So we need a compelling vision in networking. And I think we're kind of not bold enough. We make incremental progress. We say, OK, let me add this. Automation is great, but, and we don't do enough. But it's still incremental. And we need to just jump way far ahead. <coughs> Providers say that the economics of networking is not working. My daughters don't care. They just need the network to work. And they want the network to work ahead of their wanting food, sleep, or anything else. So just for the sake of my daughters, you, gotta, you guys got to make this happen. So um, as uh, Rami started this whole conference with, digital cohesion, the idea that all these different things come together, and we, we don't have this narrow view, but we have this global view, is a vision worth pursuing. And self-driving networks won't get us all the way there, but will get us a, a really far uh, way down the line. Thank you.